If you've had a little look in the book, you may have seen the man with the longest bio ever who was supposed to be co-presenting with me, um, my esteemed colleague, Mr Richard Cassidy, who unfortunately has been pulled away on an emergency. So um, you just get me, um, but if you'd like to know about Richard's history in all its detail, it's all there in the book, believe me. <laughs> it's actually slightly longer than Frank Abernagli's bio, which is quite something, and I think we had to cut him down. OK, so in the next 25 minutes, depending on how many wonderful questions you ask, um, these are all the things that we talk about. Um, you can get to know me. I'd like to get to know you a little bit. We'll talk about the fundamentals of SOAR, um, why you should even bother, because maybe you shouldn't, but you should. Um, and I have a theory for you, which may or may not involve John McAfee. Um, tips on when you should automate updating your LinkedIn profiles, because um, that could be a thing if you get this wrong. And then how to do measurements, because measurements absolutely matter. All right, this is me. It's a very big head version of me. Um, so I'm currently Senior Product Marketing Manager at Exabeam. I've been doing this for 20 years, not as a Senior Product Marketing Manager, because if I've been doing that for 20 years, it's got a long time to do the same job. Um, I worked at McAfee for nearly 17 years. <coughs> Mapid 7 for nearly three. Um, I've condensed this down into these amazing job titles. You may wonder what Chief Apology Officer is. It's not a real job title, but my goodness, it felt like it. Um, so <laughs> I said sorry a lot for things I didn't do. Not that I had, that was the problem, but um, I worked in McAfee Labs and occasionally in, in an environment where you write code every day that removes or changes code on millions of machines, sometimes you get it wrong. So uh, that was a, uh, one faction of my role at McAfee. Global Threat Response Manager was definitely my coolest title. Um, but yeah, I've done a bunch of these things and I came to marketing for a rest. So now I get to talk in front of, uh, in front of PowerPoint, which is definitely not a rest. Um, this says Nefer file. Any guesses as to what that means? It is legal, I promise you. <laughs> no, I said it's legal. <laughs> so I like the cloud. So that's, that's the love of clouds, the, um, the opposite being nephrophobia, which definitely seemed to be more of a thing a few years ago. If you need a DJ, I'm there. If you want to talk about Sality or Conficker or boot sector viruses, and we can go all day on that stuff. I also know a lot about GDPR, but let's not say that out loud. Um, and I'm on Twitter if you'd like to follow me. That's enough of me. Um, who are you? Everyone say their name at once. <laughs> Brilliant, nice to meet you all. Um, how many of you identify as blue team type defenders in your, in your roles? Any red team type pen testing folks in the room? People like breaking things? Um, any just generic security people that do all the security and wear 79 million hats? Yes, <laughs> most people identify that way for reasons. So hopefully I've got stuff that can help you here. Okay, um, just for the benefit of the tape, things called SOAR that we're not going to talk about. This is not a political statement, and I don't know what happened there. Sometimes you Google things and that's what comes up. So that was that. So SOAR, we'll talk about the fundamentals, um, how SOAR can help you in your organisation. Um, definitely things that you should automate, how to approach this because it's not just buy a load of kit and then magic happens. Not every vendor will tell you that with security tools across the board buy this thing, problems go away. Um, and actually with SOAR, technologies and tools, you can create yourself a whole bunch of new problems and like, nobody wants that. So um, it is not a sales pitch. I'm not going to mention a single product. If you want a sales pitch, our people are downstairs. Please go and talk to them. I'm not a salesperson. Um, so SOAR has been around in some format for a while. We've been automating, well, kind of that's what computers do, right? That's, that's how they help us in their lives. The term SOAR, um, security automation, sorry, orchestration automation and response was, was coined really by the lovely folks at Gartner who like to put, kind of put a ring around things, give it a name, create a quadrant, um, all of those good things. But actually automating things, I automate myself, right now I'm being automated, but as far as using computers to make our lives better, um, certainly not a new concept by any means, otherwise we wouldn't be in this room. This is Gartner's very wordy definition of what SOAR currently means to them. Um, but most people, when we talk about SOAR, by the way, I'm, I make no apologies for SOAR puns. There's probably more in this deck. Um, <laughs> so this is what they think it is. 
a lot of times when I talk to folks about are they doing anything around SOAR yet in their organisations, they're thinking about playbooks and they're thinking about workflows. And that kind of tends to be the remit as to, uh, especially from a tools perspective, what have I got from a process point of view that I can automate? Um, how do I tie stuff together a bit better in my environment? Because I've got all these, these point products that don't really talk to each other very well. So defining what it is, it is still a little vague. I know Gartner have got their description. I would say there's two parts, really. One is getting rid of the, the low-hanging fruit processes that you do day in, day out, create a lot of risk and tie up a lot of your time and making your tools work better together. That's really where I would, I would fit the, the kind of bubble without having a huge Gartner description. So we've kind of done a quick, what is it, quick and dirty. When I talk to people about automation and security, um, there's often a look, a look of horror that goes across their faces. If I said the phrase, automated patching, no, <laughs> please stop crying, it's fine. We don't have to do that today. Um, it can be a concern. Can we trust the machines not to mess it up? Can we do that? Um, bearing in mind, I said sorry a lot on behalf of McAfee. I know that machines can get things wrong and they can do them super quickly as well. That's the benefit of computers, right? They'll screw up fast. Um, more than that, if we put in automation, does that mean our people won't have a job? Will it be harder for us as people to get jobs because the computers will take our jobs away? If we're working in a security operations centre, does that mean we can get rid of all this easy work so we only need more expensive people now? And it, that comes with another challenge because there aren't huge, huge swathes of senior SOC analysts sitting around wishing they had a job. Um, that's a separate problem. What about the junior folks? How do we hire them? How do we attract them? How do we train them? Because we don't need them anymore, right? We're doing this cool automation. So it's, there's all these concerns. And maybe if you kind of think it all together, and maybe we'll just stay as we are, because this kind of works, right? It's all right. We've got these manual processes. We've got some people. We'd like to do a bit more hiring. And should we even bother? Well, here are some questions you should ask yourself. Um, this is a real number, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. Are all your people using their skills to the best of their ability? And if they're spending time doing manual work, churning through phishing emails, like a conveyor belt. Maybe they've got some other skills that they could be using, but right now you need them to be doing this other work because that's the important day-to-day -day operational stuff. Do you have a lot of manual processes? And I imagine you may have some in your environments. It's fairly common as a thing in security. Do we have a bajillion alerts coming in every day from either SIMs or other security tools? Um, I'll talk about the number now because I think this is important. Um, a dear friend of mine over at Trend, Rick Ferguson, uh, did a presentation recently at a different event. Um, other events are available, but obviously this is great. Uh, and he was saying they did some research around um, how many analysts would you need to be able to deal with the volume of alerts coming into your organisation every day. And they took the example of a large bank. Not a huge like global bank, but a largest kind of fairly solid enterprise level. 100,000 events a day. Um, seems to be a reasonably understood, non-made-up marketing number. But that's really the kind of volumes that they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. To be able to triage and handle that many alerts every single day, you need 217 analysts. Does anyone work in a security operations centre where there are 217 analysts? Uh, no one's ever said yes yet. They're out there somewhere. Um, on that note, so... The 217 thing, whilst seems flippant, it, it does speak to a wider issue. We can't deal with all the work that's coming in. Add to that, these damn security products, they do these things called false positives, which I've clearly mentioned before. Um, just pop quiz, how much time do you think the average security operations centre is spending on handling false positives? Like percentage of the day? <laughs> that would be really bad, wouldn't it? <laughs> It is pretty high. It's not as high as some of these numbers, but it is quite high. Um, we've, I, I'll talk about some research we've done in a second. 25% of SOC time. So one in four people, and it, uh, the average SOC tends to have around eight people from the folks we've spoken to. Six to eight, maybe up to ten. It's a lot of people just chasing ghosts. You want to be doing security, not 
wondering if this crazy wild goose chase I'm on is actually going to lead to something or if it's just something that looked a bit bad was actually just a bit of not very well done code. Or an over-enthusiastic researcher at a vendor um, deciding that something was bad. It's a lot of time. Is there a bunch of work that you're not getting to? You know, like proactive, cool, threat hunting type stuff? You know, getting into forensics or just machine comes in infected, wipe the thing, send it back out into the world, job done, security tick. But you never really get the time to learn what's happened. Why did that machine get infected? What was the attacker doing? What else has happened? It's just kind of get the thing out the door, close the ticket, done. Training. How many of you have spent time doing training for your job outside of your work hours? I find this bizarre. This is one of the few industries. I mean, I know we do it and we love it and we want to learn more, right? But this industry, it's a given that you, you're more likely to go and do training in your own time then your work provides you time to do it. And that's a little weird. But we do that, so we work crazy hours, then we go and learn more, and then we remember we've got families, or we like to go out, or maybe we just sleep. I don't know, but it's, that time is an issue. So, more reasons why you should bother looking at automation. Automation, for the right things, reduces risk. Um, so you get this operation efficiency and accuracy that you know, senior managers, board level, will love to hear more about. We're reducing risk deriving more value from the stack. All of these things are true. Um, and eliminating wasted time, which is by far the biggest enemy in any security operations team. Like, time is not on your side, ever. So being able to use technologies or tools or thought processes to be able to reduce all of these things and improve these things will make a difference. And now we get to John McAfee. <laughs> um, this isn't actually about John McAfee, but I'm going to talk about a crazy theory. Um, he seemed like the best guy to have on the screen. I see SOAR as an HR benefit. And here's why. Here's some research. This is research done by Exabeam. I've got some independent research just to back this up with something that's not my company as well in a moment. Socks are understaffed. People are leaving work because they're not doing interesting things. Leadership are worried about the experience of the staff, but they're expecting us to train outside of, of, of normal hours to get better. And regular training is pretty rare on the job. It may be like how to work this thing here, but how to actually expand your brain and be of more value to the organisation, that's the stuff that's getting done outside of work, because there isn't time. This is the um, independent research. This is a really good read. If you have anything to do with hiring people, um, or you're just a person even, which you all are, I hope. Um, have a read through this. Training is an issue, there's no time to do training. 78% of the people that were um, surveyed as part of this actually said they think that automation is going to come help them. And it is. But there are some gotchas. Like everything, you need to have a plan. Um, it isn't a case of running out and just buying tools necessary. Um, I hate, as a vendor, saying to people, but it's true, don't just buy, buy, go and buy more tools. If you don't understand what you need to do, buying more tools will never solve your problems. It just means you have less money and probably an angry boss. So you might have stuff in-house that you can use already. You can script a lot of this stuff. It doesn't have to involve buying a damn thing if you've got people in-house that can do it. You do have to think about who's going to maintain things. But there are ways, absolutely, of a DIY approach. There are tools available out there. Um, so you can look at kind of the options available to you to implement SOAR, that's the first kind of step, but then what should you automate? And more importantly, what should you not automate? This comes back to the LinkedIn profile. If you go and start automating every last process you have, things will break. And then maybe you may need to find yourself new employment. As we know, computers do things fast, and if they're going to screw things up, they'll do it quickly. There are some really good initial candidates here for things that you can go look at. Um, just some ideas here, phishing, malware, you can even automate things like threat hunts for some basic stuff. Um, I've seen people doing some really good things around um, APT and MITRE ATT&CK now where they're actually automating some of the searches there, that it's not a horrible, are we at risk of this thing because my boss read it in the paper. You kind of, you've got that thing running in the background just checking to see is anything untoward happening with some of these more potentially weird and wonderful types of attacks. Bottom line, it has to be something that's repeatable. 
has to be something that's well documented. If it's not any of those two things, you are fighting a losing battle because you don't really know what's going to happen. And it may not save you any time either. It's the repeatable low hanging fruit and the right things to go after. So yeah, opposite of the above, terrible ideas to work with to begin with. The other thing that can be useful is not automating all the things, even if you've got a great process <coughs> you think will be a good candidate. Start simple. Put some automation in, have some human touch points. Some decision trees will always need a human somewhere down the line, just because you need to make more of a risk decision than a um, risk to your business. That was what I mean, really. So you know your environment better than all of your security tools do. So if you can't add that risk context through something you can work through an algorithm and a tool, then you'll need a human touch point. But just do part of a workflow and have a look at that, see how much time it's, it's saving you. Get comfortable with it. And if you're not comfortable with it, like, step back. Is this the right thing? Are we looking at exactly the right process to automate? Have we kind of gone a little bit too far and got too excited and things aren't quite working? Please don't touch auto, auto remediation at the beginning because that can be bad. Um, it is, I've seen this again, time and time again with teams. Then we're going to do automation. We want to get to the point where you know, this whole thing is going to work and we review the phishing email. And we know that it's bad, so we check for all the other people who've got it, and we delete it, and we go to the file, and we do all this, and they're like on fire with the possibilities. But you can end up with things that aren't quite conducive to having a good business day. So leave that for, for later once you've got, got comfortable with the first bit. And then measurements. Measurements are always important. The nice thing with security, orchestration, automation, and response is a lot of the things that you're going to improve, you're tracking that now today. So things like time, like time to answer, time to detect. A lot of the operational measures that exist right now, you can see the before with a manual effort and then the after with the automated effort. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to need to put in 50 million new bits of tracking and have very, very, very amazing Excel spreadsheets going on that someone then has to update every week and painful. So, as you're looking at what to, what to automate, look at, do you have the right measurements in place for that? You should then be able to quickly see the difference as you go through the automation process. One area where, this goes back to my John McAfee theory, you may not be putting the measurements in right now, or if you're doing them, it's more likely on um, a company-wide basis, is what this does for employee satisfaction. Because assuming you come with me on this journey and you're saving time, you're using that time to invest back into your employees. So they're not having to do training at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday because that's the only time they can do it. You should see employee satisfaction go up. The other, I think, very important part to this, um, the first time I ever presented this was on World Mental Health Day um, last month. Analyst burnout is a real thing. We see it a lot. I mean, there's burnout throughout this industry is a real thing. And it's because we're working crazy hours. Um, if any of you guys know Chris Kubeka, she, um, she was the security analyst or expert called in uh, off the back of the Aramco Shamoon attacks a few years ago. She set up the security operations team um, at Aramco after all hell broke loose and they lost 80,000 machines in a, in a heartbeat pretty much when the attackers wiped those machines. She set up a team that did not work more than 36 hours a week. Every single analyst in that team did a, just a normal week and were not expected to do extra hours. And that's great if you're a Ramco, but we're not all a Ramco, we don't all have that money. But it is important, we need to be thinking about these things from a human point of view, not just, will we be better, faster, quicker, graph goes up, amazing. Um, the human factor to this is huge, because if you want to keep people and you want to inspire them, to, you know, to stay and learn and be part of your organisation, you need to show that you care about them. I think this is really important. So on that note, do we have any questions in the room or have I run out of time? I haven't run out of time. That makes a change. Mm -hmm. So first of all, working out what is it that drives you, yes. how they do it, and so you can then identify where the risk is in the development is going to just like you. I think you're going to focus around where you're going to work. I think the challenge is that requires investment in time. You 
Yeah, it is, it's it's A hundred percent, and I think just for the benefit of the type, um, th there will be there will be potentially pain if you've got a small team. I, just, I mean, we just talked about the two hundred and seventeen sock analysts. That's not it's not realistic for anyone. Let's just face that. Um, yeah, your metrics might take a bit of a whack. Like anything, having support from the executives is really important. This isn't just buying a tool and plugging it in. This is we need to fundamentally think about changing the way that we work because we want to be better at securing the business. We want to be better at looking after our people. We want to get more from our investments, not let's just buy another tool and see if we get some ROI from it. The nice thing with this is it's measurable. It's really measurable um, from all of the things that whoever it is cares about, be it from HR to the CFO, they'll be able to see the, the benefits that you've added by implementing these, this, these sorts of changes. And let's say, like I said earlier, it's not necessarily a case of going to Demisto or wherever and buying something. You might be able to do some of this yourself in-house, depending on what you've got. You might have a consultant come in and build something too. There's multiple ways around it. Any more questions? Yes. Do you, um, or have you thought about whether or not uh, people coming in new, like juniors, mm -hmm. whether they would lose a valuable like, foundation about understanding how everything works, because everything's automated and everything's thought how to run things rather than understanding? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point. One of the things I've seen done really well with this, um, again, is having so using things like checklists as part of the process. And you need to, you still need to understand how it works because if it breaks one day, as you know, computers kind of do that. <laughs> if no one understands how the damn thing works, you've now you've now stuck completely. Um, and again, I've kind of seen this firsthand with a computer system that may or may not have been at a previous company of mine that did um, required a thousand mouse clicks every day to do a software release. So um, there was a big push to automate that because a thousand mouse clicks is a lot, right? And even then, people weren't 100% sure how the thing worked, but they kind of had a clue because everything was manual and you'd go through every click. Um, but that was the other side of it, was you can't just throw it all in the bin and be like, right now, this, this, the computers do it. Because, yeah, one thing goes down, so you automated patch of system. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and the checklist thing, I think, is really important too because we do have to re resort to, um, to manual things and we do have to have an op uh, the opportunity for people to learn. And I don't think everyone should now be dropping the cybersecurity thing and retraining as an automation engineer. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but I think by automating a lot of this stuff, you then give senior people the opportunity to mentor some of the junior people. There's a, there's a whole knock-on effect that this brings that, that benefits the industry as a whole um, and can actually help close the skills gap that we talk about all the time. Yes. I had a question about auto-remediation. Yes. <laughs> As a kind of when would you recommend an organisation or what would be the requirements before you'd recommend yep. auto-remediation? And once an organisation is actually using auto-remediation, yes. what are the human checks and balances that you kind of would insist that they put in place? Sure. Um, it, I mean, there's lots of things you can auto-remediate, so I'm going to kind of generalise a little bit. Patching. Yeah, patching is an example. Um, you have to look at it from a risk point of view to start with. I would not auto-remediate production servers, as an example. And maybe not the CEO's laptop. <laughs> but um, start with kind of smaller areas where you think there's lower risk. You know, if we knock out marketing, sorry, marketing, marketing. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, the world would fall apart. That's what could go wrong. Um, but it's that kind of thing. It's maybe having a smaller user group. I've even seen organisations do it where they'll start the test bed as being the IT team, which, because, <laughs> you know, no one needs them if anything goes wrong. <laughs> so that's the first thing, I think, is the risk assessment. Um, and like anything, it is, have we done this pool of people? Is everything okay with that? Are there types of patches, as an example, that are better suited to that, um, to that auto remediation? Are we happy to do it with an application versus doing the whole operating system? Um, you know, what's, what's going to cause you the most risk if there's a problem? Um, automating testing of patches, I think, has been something that's come about through necessity. So that all has to be rolled in. If you're not, you know, if you're still um, doing Windows Update across the entire board, 
whilst I'd love to say as a security person, patch all the things all the time, we know that sometimes those practices can cause challenges. So I've seen some really good steps forward in automating patch testing as an example. But once that test is complete, what then hits the button to say, right, this is through the gates, this person needs it, they're in this group, boom, send it to them, or no, that's a production server, do not touch it, do not breathe near it, don't look it in the eye. Oh, a bit ahead. Does that help? Yes. The human touch point still, I think, is to be reviewing what's the output from that. So, um, if in a, a vulnerability management as an example, you're always kind of doing a round robin with with a VM as to, um, I've got a vulnerability, I've patched it. Has it really worked? Because sometimes patches don't work. Um, at some point, someone's got to really look back at that and say, to start with, it definitely is the machine still alive. <laughs> That's the first thing. Have we killed everything? Um, has it worked? And then again, it's getting comfy with, I've got enough checks and balances to say that this hasn't caused me a problem. I've done the right testing. I'm happy that this is working now. And I've also done some revalidation to say that this patch is actually in place and it's doing its job, because that can also cause you a challenge. So you may one day get to the end of that rainbow and the whole thing is a well-oiled machine where no one looks at anything, but I think that does sound a little Nirvana-esque. Any more questions? Are you going to go and automate all the things? <laughs> good, good. Wonderful. Thank you all very much for coming to the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we'll be downstairs if you want to come, come talk to us. <laughs> Bye, <a> meme. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, final meme, for the sake of memes. <laughs>